brought to you by RunToGold.com, the premier source for monetary science applied to geopolitical, international, and economic financial news and events. Hello and welcome back to episode 33 of the RunToGold.com podcast. Bankrupt Banks. At a Congressional Oversight Panel on the Government's Financial Rescue Program, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner testified, Currently, the vast majority of banks have more capital than they need to be considered well-capitalized by the regulators. Of course, that's to be expected with the fair value accounting changes. The banks have reported quarterly earnings which are surging. Even single-digit midgets, uh, like Bank of America, booked a first quarter net income of $4.247 billion. Oliver Garrett, CEO of Casey Research, uh, which I recommend they have some, some good stuff that comes out, he asked a couple very penetrating questions and gave a couple answers. He said, quote, for starters, just where did all this income come from and has credit quality really improved? The answers to both can be found buried in a company press release bearing the encouraging title, Bank of America earns $4.2 billion in first quarter. I'd like to draw your attention to the four most telling excerpts from this release. Equity investment includes a $1.9 billion pre-tax gain on the sale of China Construction Bank. Uh, two, non-interest income includes $2.2 billion in gains related to mark-to-market adjustments on certain Maryland structured notes as a result of credit spreads widening. Three, credit quality deteriorated further across all lines of business as housing prices continued to fall and the economic environment weakened. And four non-performing assets were $25.7 billion compared with $18.2 billion at December 30th, 31st, 2008, and $7.8 billion at March 31st, 2008, reflecting the continued deterioration in portfolios tied to housing. <clears throat> so what are we to, to learn from this? Uh, well, first, let me get this straight. Bank of America makes $4.2 billion, almost completely from a one-time sale of, ch- of a Chinese bank and some accounting sorcery on Merrill's failing mortgages. Looking at the cash position of Bank of America in these two extraordinary events uh, were backed out and preferred dividends were included, then Bank of America actually bled about $1.3 billion. <laughs> Of course, this is to be expected. The head of the sorcery order, uh, Goldman Sachs, was even more creative because they changed their calendar year for reporting purposes and effectively erased the impact of a $1.5 billion loss in December from showing up in the earnings statements. But it still did flow through to the balance sheets. But it helps with the headlines in the news. Uh, Bank of America is not the only bank to be engaged in these shenanigans. Uh, On Friday, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, that poltergeist, possessed another four banks. They had about $1.6 billion uh, in deposits total. Uh, so, you know, these small banks are going poof. Why? Well, it's clear that the credit quality continues to deteriorate at the banks and that it's not just the largest banks engaged in this accounting sorcery. On the bright side for these vampires is the steep yield curve Uh, does generate tremendous real income for the banks as they are able to suck the life out of the remaining wealth-generating companies in the economy. Uh, J.P. Morgan reported a stunning profit because the value of their bonds declined in the market, and Citigroup had a similar $2.5 billion gain. A few days ago, I was uh, attending an art walk down in San Diego with some colleagues and you know, we had some nice funnel cake and a barbecue and some smoothies and there was live music and then we got to chattering about business. One of my friends is a commercial property appraiser and he was telling me about the difficulty of appraising buildings because the market's failing to clear and there are just no data points available to to perform appraisals because there's, you know, appraisers have a lot of methodologies similar to accountants. For example, he appraises a beautiful 100,000-square-foot, high-quality office building that overlooks the ocean up in Oceanside, California. And usually, this premium building is never vacant because it's creme de la creme. But in November of 2008, its vacancy rate climbed about 20%. And, you know, it's kind of, oh, this is a one-time thing because no one wants to, to write down uh, a building, so he turned in the appraisal at $64 million. But because the vacancy rate and the lack of comparables, etc., is now typical for the market, uh, and because uh, 
the uh, the rents being paid have gone down. In quarter one, 2009, he had to evaporate $8 million off of that building. And so he turned in the appraisal at $56 million and didn't even receive any complaints from the people that owned it. I think it's ING. Uh, he told me he's currently working on the Q2 appraisal and figures he will need to evaporate another $4 million. Uh, this is what happens to real estate values when the discounted future cash flows decline because of huge vacancies and leases being renegotiated. Because this is going to carry through for you know several years. All these leases being renegotiated now at current prices are going to be carried over for five years or, or even more. When there's no bid, then there should be no value assessment, in my opinion. My suggestion to my buddy was, well, you know, if, if the market's not clearing and there are no comparables, uh, just mark the building all the way down to zero. <laughs> then I told him a story of my encounter with a senior partner at DLA Piper whose client had a 40-plus story condominium that was worth less than worthless. And this was because... Uh, somehow they'd, they'd bought this stupid thing and then uh, only 15% of the units had been sold and the county condemned it because it was built on shifting sand. And so that they're going to have to pay to tear the building down. So not only is the is the condominium not worth anything, it's going to cost them money to destroy it. And we're seeing this happen with houses in the Inland Empire of California now. A bank, rather than write them down or sell them at auction cheap, which would uh, depress the comparables, uh, they just raised 16 houses, got the Caterpillar out and bulldozed them down. Brand new houses, just bulldozed them, uh, rather than bring them up to code and sell them. So we're starting to see buildings become worth worse, worth less than worthless. That's a tongue twister. Uh, why is there such an effort to keep these asset prices high? Well, if these assets are being held for the long term, as these uh, fraudsters assert, then it shouldn't matter if they're carried on the balance sheet at tremendously understated values, right? Uh, why not carry it at zero? After all, this is the approach that Buffett takes. I've never heard of an investor suing or a regulator prosecuting fraud, except perhaps in divorce or tax cases, uh, because assets were undervalued on the balance sheets. They can always be marked up later, or a gain can be taken at a sale later. Uh, so why not understate them? You know, under promise, over deliver. Additionally, this may even have beneficial tax consequences. Of course, this type of accounting methodology may have a negative effect on fraudsters, Ponzi scam artists, and fractional reserve bankers, who are by definition engaged in embezzlement and therefore always want to misrepresent asset values to the upside, but never the downside. But it would be good for society and lead to more efficient allocations of capital to get rid of the whole fractional reserve banking uh, concept. And, you know, that begs the question, uh, what happens when the FDIC fails? So let me get this straight. The Greater Depression is intentionally exacerbated with a skyrocketing unemployment rate. Construction and commercial loans become impaired as projects are either stopped because the unsustainable consumer economy is grinding to a halt or phantom equity is evaporated. This causes the banks to either go under or become more of a credit risk. If the bank survives, then it is even a higher credit risk as their debt trades at a discount and that discount is booked as income. The banks record profits, CNBC declares all as well, and the stock market soars. I mean, does any of this make any sense? By comparison, a consumer charges up a bunch of credit card debt at McDonald's, loses their job, so their creditworthiness declines, and the bid for the consumer's credit card debt in the market declines, so the consumer, although unemployed, books income, which begs three important questions. Uh, is there any real income? Will a real economic loss be taken, and by whom? Wealth can take two forms. It can be a financial asset or a tangible asset. Tangible assets have intrinsic value and can never become worthless. Uncertainty from lying on financial statements and by costumed government officials is briskly eroding the confidence of a confidence-based system. In times like these, there stands only one safe haven, commodity currency. At all times, and in all circumstances, gold and silver remain money. Their value is not subject to counterparty risk, accounting sorcery, unless it's fool's gold or silver held in those uh, risky ETS. And they will always buy something. 
Gold is the risk-free asset and does not require fraudulently induced confidence because it generates real confidence. Fractional reserve banking is embezzlement, and the accounting rules have changed to protect those engaged in fraud. The intrinsic value of the financial com- companies mentioned is almost impossible to accurately ter- determine and maybe nothing. Asset values are rapidly evaporating and the credit quality of borrowers is quickly deteriorating, which will lead to more banks failing. On 20th of March 2009, FDIC Chairwoman Sheila Baer said some very scary words. Quote, Without additional revenue beyond the regular assessments, current projections indicate that the fund, the FDIC balance, will approach zero. Wow. The great credit contraction grinds on and holders of capital continue migrating down the liquidity pyramid seeking the safest and most liquid assets. Your illusory currency electronic digits are not safe in any of the fractional reserve banks. And when the FDIC fails, do you really think the $500 billion line of credit from the Treasury will suffice with trillions on deposit? There will be more pandemonium, and the likely cure will inflect another laceration on the already mortally wounded Federal Reserve note dollar. During these relatively calm times, I recommend developing an alternative and eventual substitute to the current monetary system by way of using currency in your business and daily life. There are three main options, using gold and silver coins, using the services of a full reserve institution like gold money, or withdrawing the Federal Reserve notes and putting them under your mattress and using the cash in your business. Anyways, that's been episode 33 of the RunToGold.com podcast. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the RunToGold.com podcast, the premier source for applied monetary science on the web. Thank <laughs> you.